Hello everyone, Eric the Car Guy here, known on this channel as ETCG1. And today I'd like to cover what I'm going to call the big picture. And what I mean by the big picture is there are those times when like say you're working on something and you're asking yourself why the heck did they design it this way? Why is it so difficult to remove this part? Why is it so difficult to perform this service? Or the phrase, what idiot designed this? <laughs> that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to address here. And it's not so much in defense of the audio industry, it's just from what I've seen. And, and this is all pure conjecture on my part based on my experiences, mainly at the dealership. Uh, and and that's, that's where I get a lot of this from because when you, when you get to see a particular car line as it comes out year after year after year, and you also are privy to the information that say a manufacturer will give you uh, as a technician working for a particular car line, uh, you begin to develop certain opinions uh, or, or you begin to see certain patterns might be a, a better way to put it. But my, my purpose in discussing the big picture is really to point out that cars are designed by committee or should I, I should say vehicles, not just cars, trucks. So you've got people in a design department, you've got people in an engineering department, you've got people in a finance department. Uh, several different disciplines come into play whenever they manufacture a vehicle because they, they spend a great deal of time and effort trying to figure out how to design the best vehicle they can with the materials and price that they, that they need to meet. So in essence, what happens is You've got some people from one particular discipline that need to work with people from another particular discipline. For example, like say for instance, the engineering department has figured out a way to, to make this part like last a really long time. But then the people in finance come down and they say, well, you know what? We can't use the materials that you want to use for this part, so you're gonna to have to come up with something else. So they go back to the drawing board, so to speak, and they rework the part according to the new specifications. Now that part may not be as good as the original part that was designed, but it's something that they had to do in order to get the car made. You've gotta remember, a lot of people's jobs are on the line here. I, I don't care what the car company, or what country the car company is that, that we're talking about here. There's a lot of people behind whatever vehicle it is you walk into the showroom with and drive out of the lot with. So th there's a lot of research and development that goes in there. There's a lot of safety, things that they have to conform to. There's a lot of mandates by particular local governments, uh, national governments, things like that, that need to happen in order for them to sell a vehicle. It's not just something that's done on a whim. They spend years developing these things. And, you know, getting back to that point of, you know, an engineer says one thing and maybe a design, well, let's back up for a second. Like say for instance, a designer comes in and designs this really cool concept, you know, this really great car. But then they look at it and they think, well, you know, the cost of machining and tooling, all that stuff is prohibitive. So we have to tone back that design. Um, that's that's kind of what I think is behind the whole concept philosophy. That's why I think uh, vehicle manufacturers put out concept vehicles. Uh, mainly so that they can show what they're capable of and, and try out their skills that may be something new. You know, the, the things that are found in the concept car may trickle down into the cars that are sold in the next few years. So that's what's exciting about the concept philosophy. But pretty much what I've seen is, you know, it's, it's, there's, I'm not saying there's not coordination between those departments, like say between design and engineering. I'm saying there is, but there's always a compromise. So pretty much, I think at the end of the day, what you end up with with that finished vehicle is just a series of compromises that gets you to where you are. Now that part that you're finding very difficult to take off may be a result of one of those compromises. Because somebody maybe is probably well aware of the difficulty of performing whatever task that is, but they either tried to design it so that you wouldn't have to replace that part, or there was nothing that they could do. There was some other department that came down and said, we're gonna trump everything that you just did or said and we're just gonna put it together. Tell me if I'm wrong, because that's just what I've seen. Like I said, I don't think these people are deliberately out there trying to screw you over so that you can't fix your car. I think what happens is, like I said, cars are designed by committee. It's a series of compromises that get you to the point where you actually have a finished product. So, and there's, there's only so much money they can spend per unit. And think about this. Let's take bleeder valves, for instance. Bleeder valves on Hondas, it's something I have personal experience with. 
They pretty much disappeared around the 1999 model year. Now they made filling the system so much easier, but they just went away. Same engine, everything's the same. They just took the bleeder valve out. B-series uh, four cylinders, a perfect example of this. So here you are in a situation where they look at this and they say, where can we, shave, where can we save on cost? So they want to shave off anything they can. So the, the cost of machining the hole and threading the hole and casting that little bleeder valve is saved per unit. You do that over a million units, even if it's only three or four cents, that's a significant amount of savings. So this is where they're coming from. I mean, they build millions of units. So anything that they can save on one unit is transmitted all over the entire car line. They're in a position to where they want to make the most vehicle that they can make within the cost allotted to them. Because you gotta think there's manufacturing costs. There's cost of materials, there's cost of labor, there's cost of making those machines that make the cars. And, and these things only run pretty much for a model year. That's why, you know, you see for several years, like they're all built on the same chassis. General Motors is famous for this. They've got like a certain platform and they just build vehicles off of that platform. They just keep on going, going and going and going. Um, and, and they just change the outside little bits at a time over the years so that you can differentiate one year from the next. This is kind of what I'm getting at. So just keep that in mind the next time you're under the hood and you're thinking to yourself, what blobbity blop design this blobbity blop thing. Just remember that they probably weren't doing it to, to screw you over. They were doing it because they had a certain mandate to meet. That's all I wanted to cover in this video. I'm very open to your comments on this one, so please just uh, submit them below and we'll open up this discussion and uh, see, see where it goes. Anyway, I'm Eric the Car Guy. You can always find me at ericthecarguy.com or on Facebook and Twitter and now on Google+. And if you have car questions, please head on over to ericthecarguy.com and submit them over at the forum or use the search function. Anyway, I'm Eric the Car Guy reminding you to be safe, have fun, and of course, stay dirty. Oh, and by the way, I'm ETCG1 here. See you later.